Good afternoon, everyone. This is a great pleasure for us to organize these great debates, which are addressing the question, are the forest a solution to climate change? And the topic of this debate was chosen not by accident. So there were a couple of reports which were produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was talking about the role of forest in taking up CO2. And taking up CO2 is needed to actually get to the targets of Paris Agreement. On the other hand, forests are the living substances and we cannot just take them as a CO2 pumping machine. We need to look what happens with the forest, what are they doing, how they are behaving. So the question for this debate is, do we really understand the role of the forest and the climate agenda? Uh, I would like to introduce our absolutely stunning and outstanding panel which is comprised of for all the continents and genders and very, very balanced opinions about the role of forest in the climate agenda. So our first panelist is a Professor Jir. He is a professor of the Institute of Atmosphere Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and the director of the CAS Global Change Research Center for East Asia. He holds BC in ecology from Inner Mongolia University and a PhD in environmental change from Beijing Normal University. He serves as a member of International Science Council Regional Committee for Asia Pacific. He was a coordinating lead author of the IPCC Special Report on Climate Change and Land, the sixth UNAP Global Environmental Outlook Report and the fourth China National Assessment Report on Climate Change. Professor Jia has a broad research interest in terrestrial ecology and atmospheric sciences. He published over 100 peer-reviewed papers in the high-profile journals such as Science, Nature, Climate Change, and Global Change Biology. Thank you, Professor Jir, for joining the panel. Our second panelist is Dr. Bronson Griscom. Uh, Dr. Griscom leads the conversation, uh, Conservation International Science that is applied to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere through natural climate solutions. He received his master degree from New York University in plant genetics and conservations. He completed a PhD in tropical forest ecology from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a postdoc at the Cannon Valley Institute in West Virginia, studying restoration of high elevated Appalachian watersheds. Prior to joining Conservation International, Dr. Griscom served as the Director of Forest Carbon Science at the Nature Conservancy, where he led the research team that published the landmark study on natural climate solution in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2017. Thank you, Dr. Griscom, for joining the panel. The third panelist is Dr. Luciana Vanigati. She has a basic education in chemistry and she conducts research on atmospheric chemistry focusing particularly on greenhouse gases. She coordinates a greenhouse gas laboratory at the National Space Institute in Brazil. She works on a multiple collaborative project with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the University of Leeds and multiple international partners to study a long-term balance of greenhouse gas in Amazon. The focus of your research is to understand the impact of climate change and human activities on Amazon carbon balance. She has more than 750 citations and she co-authored several nature papers. Thank you Luciana for joining the panel. And our last panelist is Dr. Catherine Scott. Dr. Scott is an independent research fellow at the University of Leeds where her work focuses on interaction between forest and the climate. Dr. Scott's research looks beyond the carbon aspect of forest and addresses the exchange of energy, water, volatile organic components between the land surface and the atmosphere. Dr. Scott is the director of the Leeds Ecosystem Atmosphere and Forest Center, through which she works with a range of external stakeholders, including charities, local authorities, and UK government. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for joining the panel. With this, uh, absolutely amazing people with their super renowned uh, experience in the forest, understanding the forest and managing the forest. I would like our panelists to actually give a short statement 
on the topic of the debates, Are Forest a Solution to Climate Change? And we will start from Professor Gier. Um, as you know, all the climate scenarios which we look at in the IPCC report, they say that we would require quite substantial negative emissions. So how much do you think the forest can help in that? Is it reasonable to expect that with massive reforestation and afforestation, we can actually achieve the climate objectives of Paris Agreement? Professor Gier, the floor is yours. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we can answer the question, are forests our solution to climate change? We have to start from some pathways. We know that forests influence climate in two major ways. One is biogeochemical, as we familiar as a CO2 budget and other greenhouse gas budgets. So uh, forests uh, release uh, carbon and also absorb carbon. So uh, another one is biophysical. Uh, that uh, normally uh, people are not very familiar is through the modified energy balance with our beetle and a web transformation. That means reflect energy back to atmosphere and also transmit the water vapor to the atmosphere. So those are two processes also influence energy. So those are two. In terms of uh, the solution, we see uh, uh, both positive and negative uh, processes linked to forests. Uh, in the positive part, we know that forests account for about 22% of global ice-free land surface. And there's a general trend of greening. That means that we see forests can take more CO2 from the atmosphere now through CO2 fertilization and through some uh, reforestation efforts, for example, green for green and the bioenergy. Uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, negative part now. The first is that forest is limited by bioclimate zone, and we cannot plant forests any, everywhere. So forests can only grow in the habitat that's suitable for, for forests. That's the one. And also, uh, in, uh, under the climate change and extreme climate condition, there's some disturbances, for example, fire, pest, insects, and deforestation. Those are actually uh, compromise our efforts of uh, uh, forest uh, natural solution. Uh, in terms of biophysical effect, there's quite a mixed picture. Uh, in some area and some biomes, actually, there's a warming effect. In some uh, uh, regions and biomes, there's a little bit of cooling. So there's a trade-off and a synergy. We can discuss this later on. In general, we could see that the forests are natural-based solution for climate change. However, there is a limitation for this solution. I stop here. Thank you very much. Our, this is very balanced and very interesting statement. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Griscom to look, to provide his views on the forest as a solution. And probably in the nature of your work, you look at the diversity of different solutions, not just forest, but all the other interconnected nature-based solutions. So in the whole spectrum of the potential nature-based solution, what role do you think the forest can play? Can, can we impact somehow the, capa the capacity of the forest to uptake CO2, or can we do some other management practices that can help us to use the forest or to look at the combination of the other solution together with the forest. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm absolutely confident that uh, forests play a large role in the solution to climate change. Um, and taking a step back to the fundamentals, plants are central to the global um, flows of carbon in, in, our, in our atmosphere and in our ecosystems. Um, and uh, even today, uh, you know, the flux of carbon, both in and out of plants, as, as uh, my colleague just described, um, are, are actually the largest um, sort of source of, of fluxes of carbon on Earth. 
Um, they're largely balanced, um, not fully balanced, but they're, they're largely balanced. And of course, the, the flux, the emissions of carbon from fossil plants are what is not balanced, right? Because of humans um, burning essentially fossil plants, fossil fuels. Um, and so, um, uh, and so the, in a sense, of course, we absolutely have to, to drive down the emissions of fossil, um, of fossil plants. But meanwhile, the elephant in the room is to what extent can we um, uh, enhance the, um, the massive role that um, living plants play in um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we can do that both by reducing the destruction of ecosystems and by um, increasing the, the growth, um, the restoration. Um, and improve management of ecosystems. So, so what we've done is we've done a number, of, a couple of studies where we have synthesized a large number of, of other studies and, um, and, and, and conducted some additional uh, research to fill gaps to look at sort of break down this question and, um, and essentially run the numbers on this. Um, and so here are the numbers that we have uh, uh, arrived at that um, uh, ecosystems overall in nature can deliver um, cost effectively about 11 gigatons of CO2 um, mid climate mitigation per year, uh, both through avoided emissions and through increased sinks. Um, and um, forests, if you can click to the next one, um, uh, play about 80%, uh, uh, about nine gigatons of that, of that global um, role of nature. So they are the largest component of that um, ecosystem role. The numbers that we have here are constrained or sort of, we have essentially reduced, these are far below the maximum potential. Um, and, and, and here's how we've constrained these numbers. Um, so first, um, we deducted for some local biophysical effects, things like albedo in particular. And we kind of took actually pretty draconian uh, deductions. So we, we actually, did not include at all um, the potential carbon sink, major potential carbon sink of uh, restoration or expansion, re-expansion of boreal forests due to the albedo effect, which can counteract the, car the, the gain of removing that carbon. Um, and, um, and we also um, uh, did not include avoided deforestation in, in albedo, re in uh, boreal regions. Um, on the other hand, we actually did not um, add the benefit of, of what are called uh, local biophysical effects also in the tropics. So in the tropics, it's the reverse. When you add forests, um, they pump um, um, water into the air through transpiration and actually increase cloud cover, which increases re reflectance. So we didn't actually um, essentially do the reverse, which is sort of add the benefit, um, the other types of benefits uh, to climate of forests and tropics. So we think that we have made conservative deductions uh, for these other effects that I think we'll be discussing. But I'm very curious to hear from my colleagues about, about, um, about more about that. Um, in any case, um, we, and then uh, in addition to that, we avoided any kind of um, reduction in, in global croplands, um, reduction in the, in, the, in the production of wood. We need wood because it's a relatively low carbon footprint structural material. Um, and finally, then we constrained these estimates um, to be cost effective. So we wanted them to be essentially cost competitive with uh, the, the other forms of um, emission reductions through uh, cleaner energy and industry. So after all of those constraints, these are the numbers we arrive at. Um, and we find that over the coming decade, um, uh, nature, natural climate solutions offer about a third of uh, cost effective um, solution to climate change uh, and forests alone um, are about uh, a quarter of the, the global cost effective solution to climate change in the near term. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is uh, quite an interesting statement. And um, I would like to kind of uh, ask the response from the person who actually sits on the forest. Uh, there was a recent publication just in April this year in Journal of Science, which was done by Tim Broadbeat, who said that with the current rate of warming, in 40 years from now, none of the trees alive today will be able to survive the projected changes in climate. Luciana, my question is to you. You sit on a forest. What is happening in Amazonia? Is it growing and blooming? or is it dying? 
um, I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everybody. Um, and the answer the question, the, this answer is very complicated. I can say yes and no is the answer. Uh, Yes, because of course forest is a very important and complex ecosystem. We have not only regulation for climate, uh, absorption, capture for carbon, but also living many species, you know, and the population, also Indians. And it's a very important ecosystem for control precipitation and the temperature. Uh, and then no, because only forestry will not solve our problem. Of course, we need to change the mind we live in, in this world. We, we emitted a huge amount of carbon in the atmosphere. It's not fair hope that the nature will clean <laughs> our dirty stuff, you know. And then um, sinking in Amazon. That is where I have experience. We can see now that the Amazon are changing a lot from the human impact, the human activities. The temperature there, if we consider the whole Amazon, is uh, enhanced in 1.1 degree. We can see the, the, uh, the biggest enhancement is during dry season. And when we see the precipitation, we will also see that during dry season, we are losing precipitation. And we know the precipitation is less during dry season and dry season is longer. But this is not uh, homogeneous in the whole Amazon. We can observe that the places where is more deforested, like the east side, suffer more changes in temperature and the precipitation during dry season. We observe, for example, the worst situation is the southeast, where is the forest around 30%. Uh, the reduction in precipitation is almost 30% also, and the, during August to September, the mean temperature is three degrees higher. This is a huge uh, enhancement in temperature and they bring a very stressful situation for the, the trees. This is a typical trees from tropical forest that can't survive in this so, uh, so, so extreme condition in temperature and in drought, you know, in water stress. And then we are observing enhancement in mortality and the forests are becoming a source during this time. We observe that in this, this time, it's what put more weight in the annual mean, because the forests are losing so, so big amount of carbon during this time that you make the annual mean change. In the west part, we observe that the situation is not so, so intense. We also see changes, but we don't see so, so big changes. And when we compare uh, the changes, how the precipitation temperature influences the flux, we observe that how less precipitation we have, we have more emission and the less uptake. And for temperature, how much more temperature, more emission. When we compare east side from west side, uh, east side is around 30% deforested. But the carbon emissions in the east side is around 9, 10 times higher than west side that is in the maximum 10% deforested we see a huge uh, observe, um, differences between the two sides. And the fire emission also in the east side is three times higher. And uh, we don't see uptake in the annual mean, you know, uh, when we consider the uptake 
it during wet season that you have there. The wet season, when the precipitation comes, the temperature starts to go up, the forest is hoping to make up it and the pass to be a source. And that this is a bigger source than, than uh, during wet season. And the, the west part is still making, um, making uptake. If all Amazon could have the same condition than west part, Amazon could remove from the atmosphere around 0.7 uh, gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere, then this is uh, what we could uh, get from the, the lessons from Amazon. Okay, our, I, I would like to move our, to our last panelist, to Dr. Scott. And our, as you've heard, there were a lot of discussion and in particular in a policy making world, that um, people are considering forest as the largely as a sink of CO2. And we heard from Luciana that if you have the changes in the precipitation patterns, then that's not a sink of CO2, but it becomes the source of CO2. But the forest started living species and they are not only working with CO2, they are working with a lot of other environmental constituents and uh, they also change the environment and emit different species themselves. So could you please reflect on how complicated are the forests? What kind of the processes drive the emissions of the other constituents and not just the CO2 exchange? And can we actually evaluate the total or net effect of the growing forest on the climate? Talk to Scott, please. Hi everybody, um, good afternoon from the UK and thanks so much to the conveners for inviting me to be part of this panel. So I think uh, to address the overall theme of the debate, I wanted to start by, by really agreeing with what's been said so far in terms of the fact that protecting and restoring the world's forest is only part of the solution to climate change. It's an extremely important part but when we talk about forests contributing to climate change mitigation and actually getting to net zero uh, emissions globally, we still require um, 80 or 80% 80 or so of, of a reduction in, in, our, in our sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And, and we're, we are looking to forests to kind of mop up that remaining 20% or so of the emissions, 25% um, we heard earlier, kind of it depends on the, on the numbers that you use. So that remaining 20% um, is extremely important because there are going to be aspects of society in which we find it impossible to, to completely eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. So the, that kind of remaining uh, negative emission from, from, from forests is, is going to be extremely important. However, we shouldn't be considering forests as just a, a kind of a tool that we can deploy for, um, for mopping up carbon. They are, but they are part of the climate system themselves. And as Luciana was describing, they are vulnerable to, to, to climate changes. So in order to be able to protect these forests into the future, we have to, to cut our emissions because one of the biggest uncertainties in our understanding of how the, the carbon cycle um, will respond in the future is, is the, the response of the, of the carbon cycle to, to rising CO2 concentrations and temperature. Um, and if you could just go on to my next slide, thank you. Um, and as Oksana mentioned in, the, in my introduction there, we, uh, we know that forests do a lot more than just store carbon. Um, and a couple of these things have been mentioned by the previous panelists, but forests also change uh, how reflective the land surface is. So uh, they're, they're pretty dark in color most of the time. And if, if they are covering an otherwise snow covered or grass covered surface, that dark color lowers the reflectivity and, and that can have a warming impact um, on the climate. The, the aspect of this that I work on is the fact that vegetation emits these volatile um, gas compounds into the air. Um, and these compounds are really interesting because they, they react and then they go on to, to form um, aerosol particles. And those particles are able to, to reflect away sunlight and also potentially to, to form cloud droplets and actually make clouds brighter. 
the flip side of that is that those same volatile compounds are actually involved in some in complex chemistry that um, can lead to an increase in some greenhouse gases like methane and ozone. And so at the moment, um, it's still a really active area of research to try and understand exactly how these, these effects balance out and whether, whether they're having an overall warming or, or a cooling effect. We think that um, when you add these things together in terms of the impact on, on the composition of the atmosphere, it actually um, increases the, the, the warming impact of deforestation. The other thing that, that forests um, do or, or, or suffer from is, is burning and the um, emissions from these, from these fires are also having a, an important impact on the composition of the atmosphere. And one final thing that's extremely important is the fact that that forests more than any other kind of vegetation are actually responsible for transferring moisture from the land surface into the atmosphere. And as we heard mentioned earlier, this can um, end up affecting cloud cover um, and also importantly can affect rainfall. And we're only just beginning to develop the kinds of coupled earth system models that are able to um, robustly uh, couple together these processes so that we can actually understand how the, these different impacts play off against one another. And what we do know is that um, uh, some of these effects are, are more important in different parts of the world. So at very high northern latitudes, this albedo effect is extremely strong. Um, in the tropics, the, the evapotranspiration, so the transfer of water is extremely important. But what happens in the middle, in the, the temperate latitudes of the world, is still quite uncertain. Um, and we're really, uh, that's before we, we, we start thinking about the impact of adding new forests, we're actually still trying to work out what the impact of the, of the existing forests are. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Scott. And I think this is this is very interesting conversation we are having. Can I invite uh, the panelists to give a short reflection on the statements of each other? So we will start from Professor Jir. What do you think of the statements of the other panelists? Yeah, I think uh, from the <clears throat> Uh, our just uh, presented by the panelists. Uh, one, is, one thing is clear, uh, forests can provide the solution for climate change, but it's not the only solution. How effective of this solution can be really depend on what we do and how we do. Uh, for example, there is a very limited land uh, for our forestation and agricultural activity and others. So we have to consider this competition of land and we have to make this forestry very effective. And uh, so there's always a, always a trade-off around these different sectors. So uh, a coordinated efforts cross sectors probably a, is a solution. There's this coordination, including coordination across sectors and across countries and uh, at different regions. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. Our Chris, come please. Absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, just thank you all so much. Um, I'm so glad that we're having this discussion, this debate is critical that we that we dig into this stuff and understand it better. Um, I don't. I, I only. Con my only concern right now is that is to disappoint that we are not um, having actually a huge debate. We're we're mostly, I think, agreeing. And I would just so I'll second this agreement. Um, uh, I think I've, I agree with actually everything that's been said so far. What I would emphasize is that despite the tremendous complexity of ecosystems and their relationship with the atmosphere, there are some very basic fundamentals that we need to keep in mind um, at, that emphasize the importance of forests for, um, for mitigating climate change. Okay, so, um, so, so ecosystems hold about five times the amount of carbon that is in the atmosphere. We know that the carbon in the atmosphere is in the form of CO2 is the primary cause of climate, of climate change. Um, so what does that mean? That means two things. We must avoid um, the additional emissions of carbon from ecosystems because if we if we have too much destruction of ecosystems we will massively increase um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and 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 the flip side is that be, 
this five times a higher carbon storage is despite um, you know, centuries of impacts by humans, which means that ecosystems have the potential to hold a lot more carbon. Um, so when you put those two options together, avoiding emissions and increasing sinks, there are tremendous opportunities, um, big potential um, contribution to climate change as we've, as we've discussed. Um, and then the final point, just to, to Dr. Gia, I would agree that um, I think the restoration, uh, the expansion of forests has gotten a lot of attention. It's certainly important, but it is not the biggest opportunity. Um, the improved management of production forests, better management to increase the stocks of carbon in um, forests that we manage for timber, for example, is a huge potential and avoided destruction of, of ecosystems is a, is a huge potential. So when you put them all together, we should do all of those things, um, but there's not any one civil bullet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gatti, please, your reflection. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I think the key is we need your own knowledge to make a better job in the planet. We can see today, you know, uh, what the people are doing in Amazon. They are trying to get money, destroying the forest with the activities that have a so low uh, rentability and the, the destruction is amazing. We have so many ways to make uh, the ecosystem preserved and economic productivity. You know, if we think what we know now, you know, and then I think the, the first word is understand the ecosystem like the house of the planet and the uh, to, to, to make this, you know, work together with us, you know, uh, have uh, the, the temperature and the precipitation in the whole country is completely important for the agricultural business. Preserve the Amazon is very important for climate, for the people that live there, indigenous, the animals, many, many, many species that we have a big biodiversity there. You know, we can't play this game like that. Changing the planet, destroying, and, all, and the, the problem is how we are changing the world. Then we need to start to repair the world. And we repair ourselves to try live in more harmony with the nature. I, I think this is the solution. Thank you, Luciana. And I think we go to Dr. Scott, your reflection, please. Yeah, so I think um, I'd also agree with some of the, the first things that were said there about thinking of that we shouldn't be thinking of forests in, in isolation. So when we look at the, the kind of climate scenarios that are able to or in, in which we can successfully limit warming to below one and a half degrees, um, over the next century, there tends to be a bit of a, a kind of divergence between the amount of area given to forests and amount of land given to, to pasture for, for agriculture. And I think we have to, we have to definitely face the, the fact that at the moment we are using a lot of land for, for fairly inefficient things. Um, and that if we want to be um, kind of sequestering carbon at the scale that we're talking about here, we really are going to have to be doing things differently in terms of how we, we manage the land. And that's not to say that we have to just instantly stop farming in a certain way, but that we need to now be thinking about, well, how do we try and do these things in a more integrated way? How do we increase the carbon storage on land that's, that's also being, being potentially used for other things too? So I think, um, this is a really interesting debate in terms of the role of forests, but I would say it's pretty much impossible to, to look at forests in isolation um, in terms of how we actually move forward with, with, with trying to enable forests to contribute to climate change mitigation. Thank you very much. And um, I think that we could actually proceed to the couple of questions. Uh, there's one interesting question which is related to the, um, I think, the first speaker and that is related to the question that we have a limited locations where the forest can go and what about the new locations and the new opportunities for the sites where the forest can grow and which can arise due to climate change. 
would it be, is it considered, is it, is it part of the solution? So there are several questions around that. Are, I think uh, Dr. Gia or anybody on the panel, can you address this question, please? Good question. I will try to uh, uh, address some of this. Uh, first off is uh, forest has its uh, own habitat across the globe. There's a different type of forest over different biome, and some area never have a, uh, are suitable for forest. Uh, but good news is uh, under climate change and uh, some human uh, intervention, uh, there is uh, expansion of uh, forest habitat in many parts of the area, especially, for example, for in boreal region and uh, for the edge of the dry land. So there are uh, some uh, more uh, new chance for forests to expand. Uh, another uh, frontier is urban forests. And uh, in urban area, um, you see more and more uh, uh, urban green planted. And with the human management, they can have a, a quite uh, a large area of forest and a well maintained. So th this is uh, uh, for the forest uh, uh, location. Uh, the second part, uh, what is the second part? That, oh, that, was, all, all... Yeah, that was about the extension of the forest in the, in the new areas. Yeah, I think that's, uh, they are all related to one is in the frontier of yeah. uh, existing forests, for example, expanding forests into in eco town. Another one is urban area. And also with the human management, uh, we can we see uh, uh, some area that uh, can have a forest expansion. Can I jump in and add? Sure. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, agreeing with Dr. Gia, um, but I would just emphasize that I think, so we, we've, um, we have looked at um, urban forest, reforest, you know, bringing trees back into urban areas. Um, they, they're certainly important and I think locally very important, you know, but um, in terms of the sheer potential of, um, of essentially land available that could be available for expansion of forest, I, um, it is in rural areas. Um, and I would particularly emphasize that diet is very important. Um, so, 70%, 70% of the global agricultural lands, both grazing and, 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 and crop lands, um, are dedicated to the production of livestock, which deliver about 5% of our global food. Okay, 70% of land, 5% of food. Tremendously inefficient. Um, so basically the ruminant gut of, of livestock is a, an inefficient way of producing food. Um, I, I myself, um, historically have been a meat eater, so I'm not here to, to evangelize about that, but I'm just saying when you look at the sort of the basics of the numbers, your, uh, our diet has a big effect on, um, on land use. And I think to Dr. Scott's point, it's, you know, it, it's an interaction between, between um, our sort of production lands and, and, and for food and, and forests. So if we improve our diets, reduce food waste, um, it could release a huge amount of land um, for, um, for, for forests. Uh, thank you very much. Our, we have quite an interesting and challenging questions to the panelists, which I find quite, quite um, challenging. What panelists think about the emergence of the initiatives from oil companies focusing on afforestation as opposed to the protection or appropriate reforestation, given the limited land area trade-off and large-scale tree planting and the need to reduce fossil fuel as well. What is your reflection on that? Um, I think first we needed to understand the complexity, you know, of uh, the changes we are promoting. If we first reforest uh, the, the deforest areas, uh, we can repair the ecosystems. Uh, the, the sound is okay. Yep. Please okay. go ahead. Uh, we we see many examples in Brazil, for example, 
we are looking during dry season reduction in precipitation, including the main part of the country that you produce food. You know, then we are losing production deforesting Amazon. You know, uh, the fire enhances also temperature that reduce precipitation. The wet season go far, go far, go far. Now we are looking. In January, that was a very strong month with precipitation, less precipitation. And then uh, accumulate more precipitation during February, March. And then the agribusiness are also losing productivity because of the amount that is rain in these two months is much bigger. We are observing uh, many places and in many sectors that we are losing in productivity, changing the systems, you know, change the cycles. This is one issue, another issue is the people just thinking area to plant. And then they, they the forest everywhere include uh, uh, inside the rivers, include the, the sources of waters, and we have less, uh, less ability of water for everybody. And then, you know, I think the first issue that we need to put in practice is to conserve the health of the ecosystems. In, in a part of what we are looking in the, in the, in the earth is what we are changing you know, in the ecosystems that are promoting many changes. It's not only how much CO2 we are putting in there, but we are changing all the systems uh, you know, in the atmosphere, to land, to precipitation, the rivers, the animals, and then go to the ocean. I think the complexity of the system is so big that we can't just uh, work like a manager of the, the, the natural places, you know. We need to repair the important ecosystem like Amazon, like other places, you know, and uh, make a big effort in reduce emissions. Thank you, Luciano. I think we can take one question to Dr. Scott. And this question is actually related to the complexity of the forest and in connection between the biogenic emissions. So the question is, um, as the climate is changing and we have an increasing temperatures, what do you think? Is it a tropospheric ozone which is formed around the forest or is it a drier conditions that can actually impact the uptake of CO2 by the forest? Yes, yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, so I think to, to start with the, uh, yes, we know that the biogenic emissions um, when when they're emitted into the atmosphere they they can help to form ozone so they're part of the, the chemical process that that does that and so understanding the conditions under which that happens versus um the, the there's another process where these chemical compounds will actually react with ozone um and deplete it so the getting an understanding of the balance of, of when those two things happen um, is really important in terms of understanding how much ozone would be produced or what the impact on ozone would be um, you mentioned there the a change in climate and as um, some of the, the, the very important controls on the emission of these volatile organic compounds are, are climate changes. So as temperature rises, we expect the emissions of, the, of, of, of these compounds to, to increase. And so uh, one of the things that we, we're looking at now and people have been looking at for a while is, is what we expect the impact on, on that process of climate change to be. Um, and you, there was a, a point as well about um, about deposition, Oksana. I don't know if you could just repeat the question. So the question was, uh, which process is it? Is it more the formation of the tropospheric ozone, or is it the dryness itself that will impact the CO two uptake by the forest? Ah, I see. Okay. Oh, well. um, <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> I think in terms of the, the ability of the forest to take up carbon, the actual climate conditions will be a, a greater, um, have a greater impact. There is, um, yeah, ozone in the atmosphere uh, can, can have an effect on, on plant productivity, but in terms of the, 
the I guess the most concerning impacts in terms of future climate change um, it's the, the overall impact on the on the on the climate okay thank you very much we take two more questions and our next question will be uh, probably yes and no by the panelists so <clears throat> there were several people asking for can we hope that forest will always do some mop up for greenhouse gas emissions and that will do it indefinitely are there limits or not so the the answer by panelists can be yes no i don't think so <laughs> and we take and after that we take another one and we go to the voting i would say no because uh, forest has its uh, own uh, lifespan start from pioneer to mature to climax every stage has its uh, different uh, uh, potential for a carbon sink uh, so this depend depend on age and depend on the con condition and depend on the region in the located i would mostly agree uh, with dr jia um, and the so there's a what's called saturation period um and um once we get out to about 20 or 30 years um <clears throat> uh, once a forest is about 20 or 30 years old the the net rate of sequestration of carbon begins to slow but it continues um for you know over 100 years and um and then in the case of co2 fertilization what we're seeing is even old growth or in very old forests are continuing to have a net sink um that net sink is 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 beginning to decline as they as they saturate but it is actually quite interesting to note that even very old forests um, are continuing to absorb uh more carbon than they are releasing um and then there are some exceptional systems like mangroves and peat wetland systems, which um, are, uh, you know, so, so wetland systems are effectively the source of fossil fuels. They're, they're, that's kind of uh, the way that, that, that um, peat forms and eventually becomes a fossil fuel. So those, those systems actually just continue to, to be a sink for carbon essentially indefinitely. But those are um, not nearly as extensive an area as, as um, essentially upland forests for which, as Dr. Gia said, you you know you eventually will saturate um, largely with with the exception of that um, CO2 fertilization effect. Um, I, think, I think that the the main issue is of, of course we tend to the equilibrium if we stop uh, you know make changes. But, uh, we need to avoid that the forest to become a source. That what is happening now. You know, the main, the main source from Amazon is the Bama's Bam. But to make many other changes, you know, in degradation and uh, is making Amazon be a source. We need to avoid that, you know. I think we need to think more in, don't make the forest become a source, preserve the species, the ecosystem, the, the cycles of water, temperature, you know, we need you to think more in preserve than think about the definition. Because uh, now, uh, you know, the foresting is making a one more source in the atmosphere for CO2. We have a natural example, then I think we need you to repair the natural ecosystems. Thank you. And uh, the short reflection from Dr. Scott, and then we go to voting. Yeah, so um, I think as, as Bronson was saying there, we, we know that actually a quite a lot of older forests are continuing to take up, take up carbon. But I, I think the issue is that as, as some of the, the work that Luciana has been doing has been showing is that we're getting into a, a situation now where we don't necessarily know exactly what's going to happen in the future. In terms of, uh, of the health of these forests so i think where we're starting to see carb um forests that were carbon sinks shift to become uh, carbon sources is where we've we've got increased mortality of the trees and so i think although our our understanding of the way that forests work and our, and our kind of observations of forests so far tell us so much um 
it is difficult for us to kind of be certain about exactly at, at which point um, any individual forest it may, may tip from, from being uh, a continued sink to, into being a source. So overall, I would say, yes, <laughs> we expect forests to, to continue to take up carbon, but we can't be certain at the point at which that, that will stop. Okay. So our, at this point where we actually don't know what will happen in the future, I would like to thank the panel and let's invite the participants to do the vote. Uh, Claudia, can you put up the slide where people can see? So I would invite every one of you to take your phone and go on the menti.com and put the code which you see on the screen <laughs> I think all the panelists are very happy to see the results. <laughs> and I would invite the participants to move to, if it works, to the key message which you brought from this debate. What is it, the key message when we're finished today that you can say you learn and you want to retain it with you. I think there are some important messages which I would like to highlight and as a positive note, we've seen that there were words, hope, it is complicated, protect the forest, forests are important. And um, I would like to thank our panelists for joining this debate. You guys are great, you're doing great job you are giving hope to people though everybody understands it's, it's complicated it's difficult thank you very much